It's, uh, it's good to see everyone, and I'm just going to lay this out at the very, um, the very front end of the sermon. Um, our lights um, kind of go in this spurt where sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. We are talking with engineers right now uh, to see how to get a better lighting system in the church and do that economically. Um, but they've been really, really wonky today. So here's what we're going to do. Um, if we're in the dark, we're just going to we're going to forge on through. Last service was down for about five minutes, but we're just going to act as if nothing happens, and we're just going to be in God's Word. So I, I just want to tell you, um, it is my opinion, and it's a very strong opinion, that the 1980s is the greatest decade ever. And, and so there's so many things about the 80s that just are so admirable. In fact, my wife and I, we were driving to town the other day discussing the glories that is 1980s music. Uh, there was just so many wonderful things that, that, that came from that. And, you know, the 80s gave us Reagan. Uh, the 80s gave us the Cola Wars. Y'all remember the Cola Wars, the Pepsi Challenge and so on? Y'all remember Cabbage Patch Dolls and the frenzy that happened all around that? Um, my wife still laments that we don't have big hair like we did in the 80s. Uh, you know, so the ladies had, and, and her expression is, the higher the hair, the closer to God. That's um, uh, crazy fashion. Uh, and I think the best movies ever. In fact, um, i just tell you, the, the other day I was walking through the living room, and I looked at my, my youngest son, and I said, is this Indiana Jones? And he said, yep. And he says it's on Netflix, and he watched all three Indiana Jones movies. I don't call, consider the one that they made a couple years ago a real Indiana Jones movie. So uh, the 80s brought us incredible movies. In fact, there was one particular um, screenwriter and director from the 80s that it's actually been well documented that there was, there was a certain psychology and certain beauty in the movies that he wrote and, and directed. His name was John Hughes. He gave us um, uh, movies like Uncle Buck. Y'all remember Uncle Buck, uh, that, that movie? Uh, the Breakfast Club, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, which is one of the classic movies of all time. Home Alone, albeit that was the 90s. She's Having a Baby, Mr. Mom, my favorite, The Great Outdoors with John Candy and, and, and Dan Aykroyd. Uh, just an, an incredible movie, but probably his, his, his most famous movie is Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And I can remember, I grew up, uh, I was in high school in the 80s, and sometimes we would get together as friends. What do you want to do? Let's watch Ferris Bueller. And we watched that movie over and over and over. So there's a quote that I want to share with you from that particular movie here today. Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you can miss it. And so I'm going to kind of camp here for a few moments, but I want to lay out uh, that phrase, but I'm going to add something to it here today. Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss what God is doing. See, I, I'm of the opinion that we can get busy living life. In fact, we can get really busy just kind of doing life, and we fail to see what God is, is actually doing. That He's actually up to something much, much bigger than what we can actually grasp or imagine. In fact, I think in the life of Jacob, and we've been in the life of Jacob the last couple of weeks, and we have a couple more weeks to go. But the life of Jacob, and, and this whole idea that he was a man who wrestled with God, and I actually think God wrestled with Jacob even more, that he got into a period of life where it would have been real easy for him to just kind of say, this is life. I'm living life. I'm doing what life is supposed to be. Uh, and, and, and all the while, God is actually up to something incredibly big in Jacob's life. I just don't think that he really understood the magnitude of everything that was happening. So we think about Jacob's life. Up to this point, we know that he was born a twin. There was, there was contentiousness even in the womb with his twin. Uh, his, his mother said, it's as if two nations are, are battling inside of me. But uh, his older brother, Esau, came out first. Uh, Jacob was actually grabbing his heel as he's coming out, trying to pull him back in. And, and so with that, uh, they kind of grew up kind of in, in, in very different personalities, very different people but at odds. 
So one day, as, as Esau came in from hunting, uh, Jacob tricked him into giving him the birthright. The birthright meant that whoever had the birthright got a double portion of the inheritance. And so that's what, what, what Jacob uh, received because he stole that from his brother. And then he tricked his dad into giving him the blessing that was rightfully uh, supposed to go to Esau. So you can see Jacob is not a stellar individual. And because his brother has in mind to kill him, uh, he kind of says, okay, now it's time for me to get out of here. His dad says, listen, you need to go find a wife. So he actually goes to um, what is called Haran, which is a modern-day Iraq, and he's on his way to his, his family, would have been his mother's family, to find a wife. On his way, he has an encounter with God. In fact, a pretty amazing encounter with God where there was angels and there was stairways and there was earth and there was heaven. And God actually communicates to him and, and says, listen, I'm going to, be, I'm going to do this for you, Jacob. And, and although Jacob hears that, he's still kind of like, I'm still not there. I'm still not there, but he continues to make his journey even though God has, has said, this is, I'm going to be with you, and, and I'm going to do some pretty amazing things in your life. So that brings us to where we are, and we're going to be in Genesis chapter 29. And one of the things that, that we find here today is that Jacob comes upon this watering hole. In fact, this watering hole, in, in, in many ways, was just a, a stone that they they would put in place, and then it would. Then when they removed the stone, the water would come out, and it would be a place that the sheep would, as they were grazing in the wilderness, would be able to come up and, and find water. So he meets these guys and finds out that he's really close to the, the area where his uncle is, and he's excited. In fact, they, they tell him that his daughter is on, his way, on her way. In fact, they look and see, and, and this is what we find in, um, in, in verse, uh, verse 9. It says this, while they were still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Now, as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, uh, the daughter of Laban, his mother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. This is no romance here. This is ultimately that uh, one of the things that we find, this is a familial sort of thing is happening. And it says, And Jacob told Rachel that he was, his, uh, was her father's kinsman, and that he was Rebekah's son, and she ran and told her father. But as she ran, one of the things that, uh, that there's, there's this little stirring that's going on in Jacob. In fact, this is kind of the love at first sight sort of thing, where he's fallen in love. And so this kind of speaks to the humanity of the Bible. In fact, one of the things that I, I think we could look at this, and as, as Jacob has seen Rachel for the very first time and he is falling in love, I'm going to say Jacob is living life and he's doing in life what, what we expect people to do. And then we get to verse 15. And in verse 15 it says, Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, uh, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were, were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and in appearance. This is the Bible's way of being very kind and saying Leah was ugly. <laughs> but, but, but Rachel was pretty, and, and so on. But it says, Jacob loved Rachel... And he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. That's one of the more beautiful statements in all Scripture right there. I mean, it's, and, and again, we... We don't understand. It's a different culture, and it was very, uh, very common for a dowry to be given to a father so that uh, someone could marry his daughter. And while Jacob did not have a dowry, he said, "Listen, allow me to work for you, and that will serve as as that that dowry for your daughter." 
And then it comes on, he says, listen, he works seven years. And, and the Bible makes an editorial comment. He works seven years, but it seemed but a few days. There's romance. In fact, we find that in the Bible. And again, that's the humanity of the Bible. And Jacob is just simply living life. Now, Jacob works seven years, and he eventually comes up to, to Laban. And he says, listen, I've worked seven years. And now's the time for me to, to marry Rachel. And so Laban agreed to this, and, and so one of the things that we have in our society today, when there's a wedding, there's this, this big event, and there's parties, and there's, there's celebrations, and there's lots of expense, and different things like that. In the ancient world, especially at the time of Jacob here, that was not necessarily the custom. The custom was you go to the tent, and there's two people in the tent, and you consummate the marriage, and that is the wedding ceremony. So Laban says, go into the tent, and as he goes into the tent, it is dark, and he wakes up the next morning, and the birds are singing, and the sun is shining. He looks beside him to find that it is the ugly sister. So he has been duped. And he goes out to Laban and says, what's up with this? I mean, he's, he's clearly not happy. And Laban says, well, it is our custom to ensure that the older daughter marries before the younger daughter. And this is what I consider house rules. You don't know what house rules are? Have you ever gone to somebody's house and you're playing cards? And in the middle of playing cards or a game or a board game or something like that, and you expect one set of rules and they say, oh, but, 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 but wait. At our house, the rules are. So there's a certain set of rules that apply to this game for just your house. Well, Laban basically says, these are the house rules that I didn't tell you about before we started. So he again, he agrees to, to, to give Rachel in marriage. And as he gives Rachel in marriage, one of the things that we find is he is going to work another seven years. And so after the week of what would be considered the honeymoon, he now marries Rachel and works another seven years. But then we get to verse 31, or actually verse 30. And in verse 30 of chapter 29, we find just a little bit of a statement. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. And served Laban for another seven years. He loved Rachel more. Now that was clear from the outset. But this kind of sets a stage of some dysfunction and, and friction that is going to happen throughout the remainder uh, of, our, of our time here today. And we'll even go into to other generations as well. But we find that now Jacob has two spouses. Now, I'm just going to leave this right here. Some of you are probably saying, but I thought that in the Bible um, that, you know, God said the two shall become one flesh. And, and, and we look at this, and one of the things, I, I want to just kind of give you a principle that I learned many, many years ago. It was taught to me, and I want to teach this to you here today. When we talk about plural marriage, the Bible often reports history but doesn't necessarily condone it. So it tells us what's going on, but it doesn't necessarily say that God is putting his stamp of approval on this. So the Bible reports that there is this, this polygamy going on, that Jacob has two wives. I believe, in fact, we're going to see that God works through this, but the reality is it's not necessarily saying God is saying that this is what he wants everyone to do, or that he actually even wanted Jacob to do that, but yet he was able to to work. But we also see verse 31. And in verse 31, it says this, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, and earlier it says that he loved Rachel more. Now he says that she was hated. He opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And so what we begin to see right now is that there is, there's dysfunction. And how could we expect that there not be dysfunction in this situation? But there's dysfunction within this marital system of one man and two wives. And so God begins to, to intervene here, and, and actually Leah has four boys. And as she has four boys, this is not sitting well with Rachel. And we get to verses 1 and 2 of chapter 30, and we begin to see something. It says this, When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister, jealousy, 
She said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. I'm sure there was a little bit of drama in that. Jacob's anger kindled against Rachel and he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? And, and so, again, we see marital discord, and we see friction, and we see anger, and, and all of these things. And if I were to stand and, and talk to Jacob, and Jacob saying, man, my life right now, I've got this going on, and I, I've, got, I've got wives that are driving me crazy. All right, there's always this fighting, there's this contention, there's this jealousy, and I've got this crazy, I mean, crazy, crooked, wicked father-in-law. One of the things I'd probably say is, listen, welcome to life. This is kind of how life works. People are dishonest. People are crooked. Relationships are hard. And so Jacob is is going through all this. And after he tells Rachel that, listen, I'm not God. I can't do this. She says, oh, how about you have my servant? And, And so the servant becomes, in many ways, a surrogate. But they didn't have the technology and different things like that we have today to allow people to do surrogates. They had to do it the old-fashioned way. And, and so even though he was married to two women, he, he essentially breaks the marriage bonds and, and has, has sex with a servant here. And she gives birth, and then she gives birth to another one. And it says this in verses 7 and 8. It says, Rachel's servant Bilhah uh, conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Jacob said, with mighty, um, then Rachel said, with mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and I have prevailed. Now think about that. This is your sister and, and, and so on. And there's this competition and this animosity that is that is growing between the two and again it while it's a different situation how many times today do we have competition with people how many times do we look at someone else and say they're my competition how many times is there contentiousness in relationships and so if jacob is coming to me and saying listen this is what's going on i'm gonna say this is life dude this this is very much a part of what life is really like but then we get to verse 14 and folks i'm just gonna say this is in the bible i just don't know what to do with it let's look and 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 just kind of read on through verses 14 and, and and read through verse um verse 18 it says in the days of the wheat harvest of wheat harvest reuben went and found mandrakes in the field mandrakes were kind of this flowery plant uh in kind of a rooted plant in um in 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 the middle east and it says that he found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother leah then rachel said to leah please give me some of your son's mandrakes but she said to her is it a small matter that you've taken away my husband would you take away my son's mandrakes also rachel said then he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. I don't really see the big idea. But anyway, and it says, When Jacob came from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me, for I have hired you for, uh, um, with my son's mandrakes. It's in the Bible, folks. That's all I can say. It's in the Bible. So he lay with her that night, and God listened to Leah, and she conceived and, and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, um, God has given me my wages because I gave, uh, I gave my servant to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. I, folks, I really don't know what to do with this, other than to say what an incredibly messed up dysfunctional mess is this. I mean, this is just craziness. And this is the person that God is choosing to build a nation from. And so I'm just going to tell you, if you come from dysfunction, or if you're in a dysfunctional family right now, consider yourself to be in very, very good company. But yet it's amazing that God is able to work through this dysfunction but in the middle of this dysfunction and all of this stuff and all the strife and all of the discord and all of the life there's still good parts of life notice verse 22 it says then 
Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and, and bore a son and said, God has taken away my repro reproach. And she called his name Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son. So in all of this, there's a moment of joy. There's a moment of happiness. There's a moment where we can say, this is good, and this is also life. This is God doing some pretty cool things. Now, one of the things that we have to understand that with the birth of Joseph, we'll go several years down the road, this birth is the beginning of incredible discord and really the shredding and ripping apart of a family that will come later. But yet God will work through that as well. And so now it's time to go home. And Jacob has started a family, he's gotten married, had kids, built some wealth along the way, and he now says, listen, it's time for me to go home. But his father-in-law, the ever upstanding guy that he is, says, I don't want you to go home. I don't want you to leave. And it's not because he doesn't want to see his grandkids, or it's not because he, he's going to miss them. It's not because he's going to miss his daughters. It's that Jacob made him wealthy. God blessed Jacob, and because Laban was in proximity and Jacob was working for Laban, Laban became wealthy in the process. So they come up with this agreement, and the agreement is, Jacob says, listen, he actually says, let my honesty speak for itself, which I think that's rich in and of itself, considering who Jacob was. But he says, let, my, my, let my, my, my honesty speak for itself, and he says, listen, take all the spotted, the speckled, and the striped lambs, and goats and give them to me. Let that be my payment. And so basically, Jacob is saying, give me all the defected ones. Give me all of, of the imperfect of the livestock, and you get to keep the perfect ones. And Laban says, that's a great idea. And then Laban went and hid all the spotted, speckled, and striped of the livestock. And, and so Jacob, rather than really trusting God in this, kind of kind of the old Jacob kind of springs up. So he decides that he's going to do this, this system. And I, I really don't get it, but he basically does selective breeding and he manipulates the breeding process so as to create more spotted and speckled, but also that they would be the stronger of all of the livestock. And so there's just this, this animosity is growing between the two, but it does get to this point in verse 43 that kind of gives us a summary of, of Jacob's life, and, and this is what we find. Thus, the man increased greatly, and that man is Jacob, and had large flocks, female servants, male servants, and camels and donkeys. In other words, the man who came to Haran with a shepherd's staff, and that was it, has become a very wealthy man because God has blessed him. He's become a husband. He's become a father. He has much wealth. And it's time for him to go. In fact, in verse 3 of chapter 31, it says this, Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred, and I will be with you. And I, I love this statement, I will be with you, because as God was giving him the covenant uh, at, at what we call the stairway to heaven, the, the, the ladder, that this, this incredible dream was there. God said again before this, as he was on his way to Haran, I will be with you. And so when God says, I, I now need you to leave here, I think this affirmation to Jacob that God is also saying, I have been with you. I've been with you this entire time. As you've been living life, and as you've been going through all of the highs and the lows and the goods and the bad of life, I've been with you. In fact, I want to tell you some other, I, I said that there's this idea that the Bible reports history but doesn't necessarily condone it. That's a big picture from the Bible. I want to also give you another big picture because as I look at Jacob's life, there's a lot of stuff here. And there's a lot of bad, and Jacob is not a stellar individual. And as he is living life, and as he is doing life, and he's getting married, he's falling in love, he's having kids, he's building wealth, there's strife, there's discord, there's dysfunction, there's competition, there's all of this stuff that is going on, but God is working out his plan. 
And that's one of the things that we have to realize is God works to fulfill his plan in spite of people, not because of people. He's not doing this because Jacob is good. He is doing this because God is good, that he himself is, is perfect and he has a plan that he is working and he does this in spite of people. So if you're sitting there saying, well, I can't be used by God because I have to remind you to say God works to fulfill, uh, to fulfill his plan in spite of you, not because of you, but he can still work through you. In fact, there is this, there's a word, in fact, there's a lot of Bible words that we throw out in the church that we don't necessarily always define real well. And so I actually have a document on my computer of Bible words that I have defined in one sentence so that when I preach them, it kind of get this. So I want to throw out not sovereignty, I want to throw out, at, throw out its very close cousin, providence. And providence is this, God governs creation and fulfills his plan through the successes and failures of humans. So in other words, what God does is he takes the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful, and everything in between of our lives, and he works, our, uh, works in us to fulfill his plan. So he does that in spite of us, but that's how good God is, is that he can work in the good and the bad of life to fulfill his glory. In fact, Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says this, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. And the implication is not just the good of us, but ultimately the good of God and what God is going to do. But it also says for those who are called according to his purpose. And so if Jacob, if Jacob were to tell Jacob's story, this is what Jacob would probably say. I was a jerk. I was a jerk in the womb. I came out a jerk. You know how jerk I was? I actually stole a birthright from my older brother. And to make matters worse, I went in and I tricked my father into blessing me instead of him. My brother was so mad he wanted to kill me. And so my father said, you know what, I need you to find a wife, but I don't want you to find a wife here. I want you to find a wife uh, among our old family members. And so I was really good with leaving because I was kind of, I didn't want to die. So I acted in self-preservation, and on my trip, I, I just decided one night, I was at this place called Luz, and I just, I, I, I went to sleep, and as I went to sleep, um, I had this crazy wild dream, and God showed up, and there were angels, and there was, there was a stairway, and there was this crazy thing that happened, but in that time, God spoke to me, and he told me some pretty amazing things that he wanted to do through me, but I wasn't there yet. I really wasn't. In fact, I told God I would do certain things, but I put a big clarifier of if in that. And then I get and I get into this family, and I meet this wonderful lady, and I think I'm marrying her, and all of a sudden I wake up beside her ugly sister. Now, doesn't that sound great? And so I married her ugly sister, and then I eventually married her, and let me tell you, marrying sisters was not the easiest thing in the world. They were always fighting, there was always contention, there was always discord, there was always all this stuff going on, and Jacob is telling his story, and he's just telling the story of life. But if God is telling the story, God is telling a completely different story. In fact, I'll say it like this, as Jacob was living life, God was building a nation. Because from Jacob's sons would become not sons, but tribes, and tribes would become the framework by which God would build the nation of Israel. And so he's living life, and he's just kind of going through the motions, and God is doing something really big behind the scenes. And so today, I'm going to say it like this. I don't know where everybody is here today, but I'm going to give you some statements, and maybe these statements might resonate with you, it might resonate with your life. Maybe there's more month than there is paycheck right now and that's what life is to you maybe marriage is not marital bliss but a battlefield and this is not what you signed up for and that is life maybe the kids you wanted never came maybe the kids that you wanted and dreamed for came but now they're more heartache than they are happiness in your life maybe you're being mistreated at work 
Maybe the job isn't exactly as it was presented to you. Or maybe you're looking at a time right now where you're just without work. Maybe your family of origin, and all of us deal with stuff from family of origin, but maybe your family of origin, instead of precious memories, you have battle wounds, and that's your life. And, and, and maybe your life is one regret after another, after another, after another, after another. And it's real easy when you're going through stuff like this to really just kind of get laser focused in, into the negative of life and say, this is not the life I want. This is not the life I, I, I dreamt about. This is not the life that I, I planned for. And it's real easy to get just kind of busy doing life. But I, I want to share something because I, I believe that this is, this is also true. Just like it was with Jacob, it can be true with you. As you are living life, God is building you. God is working in your life. He is using the good and the bad and the ugly and the beautiful and everything in between to really kind of form and fashion you to be used for His glory and His purpose. In fact, maybe what God is doing with you has nothing to do with you, but it has to do with your children. Maybe what God is doing with you has nothing to do with you, but has to do with the future that He is building inside His church. But God is working, and He is working behind the scenes, and God is not done with you. And so as God was building a nation, I believe God is building you. And so it's real easy to get caught up in all this stuff. And truly, I'm going to say this, miss God and miss what God is doing and not be able to make sense of everything that is going on. So I want to share a quote, and this quote is from, from Rick Warren, who is a, a pastor in, in, in Southern California. This is what he has said. God is more interested in your character than your comfort. God is more interested in making you holy than he is in making you happy. In other words, the stuff that you're going through right now, God is working to form you and change you to be more like his son Jesus. That's the reality. And as we are living life, we sometimes miss what God is actually doing. And so I believe that as, as God was, was just kind of interjecting and as Jacob was living life, all this stuff, in a matter of ways, was God wrestling with Jacob so that God could work out his plan. And so I want to give you this comfort here today. God is wrestling with you even when you don't even realize it. God is working in your life. God is working through the events and circumstances and people that are all around you to make you into be what he wants you to be. And that's a beautiful thing. And so today, I want to give you a couple of next steps. A couple of next steps. One is acknowledge the hand of God even when you can't see it. Know that God is there, that he will be with you. In fact, Jesus promised, I am with you to the very end of the age. So we know that Jesus is with us, and we know that Jesus is doing some pretty cool things. So acknowledge the hand of God even when you can't see it. But then I also want you to, to understand this. Don't be done with you before God is done with you. You see, I think it's easy to get discouraged, and I think it's easy to throw in the towel, but the reality is, the reality is this, and I think this is such a cool reality. When God is, is working in our lives, it means He is not done with us. And sometimes it's the difficulty, sometimes it's the suffering, sometimes it's the trials that God is really working on us more than any other time. And that's when we want to throw in the towel. So I want to say this here today. Don't be done with God before He is done with you. Let's pray.